that the Lord says that he came to open the eyes of the blind. And he wasn't just talking about people who can't see. <laughs> he was talking about how the enemy will come and he'll blind our eyes to the love of God, to the goodness of God. And so we just pray this morning, Lord, open the eyes of our heart that we could see you, that we could see Jesus. Amen? Amen. Day, and it's going to be soon. When we see him coming in the clouds, think of it. Look out those windows over there. Can you see the clouds coming through the windows? One day, he is going to be coming through those clouds. And all the prophecies that are going on, all the prophecies that are accumulating so fast, like lightning, like thunder, the God of thunder is coming. And it's not Thor, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the God That's who created the thunder. He is going to come, and it says that every knee will bow, and every single tongue. It doesn't just say the Christians, the believers. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. You know why? Because they're going to see him come. They're going to see him come in the clouds. And when he comes, he's going to set up his rule and his reign on this earth. And he's going to rule for a thousand years. And it's going to be like paradise on, on this earth. He is going to rule and reign. We can't forget that. How many times do we forget it? We were talking today about how you know, we go to work and our mind is just work, 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 work. Uh-uh. We can't do that as Christians. We have to pray, Lord, the scriptures, let this mind be in me that was in Christ Jesus. And so every day we wake up and we walk out and we look at those clouds and we say, someday he's coming. And the Bible says that every knee will bow. Every knee, even the biggest atheist. Even the biggest non-believer, every knee will bow because they're going to realize this is God. This is the creator. He created this world. We got, it's, it's our heart. It's our lips. It's our mouth. It's our mind. We have to give this message to people of salvation. So that when judgment day comes, they are going to be in glory with Jesus for eternity. Because it doesn't end after a thousand year reign. It continues. Our bodies, we do not die. Our physical body may die. But our new body, the body that Jesus gonna, is going to give us, the resurrected body. It's going to walk through walls. It's going to fly in the air. There's going to be nothing stopping it. We're going to have the power of God completely to lay our hands on people, set them free, see them be delivered. We actually have that power now. But we don't believe it. Help us, Lord. That's what the word says. Help our unbelief. Guys, this is so real. This is so real. <laughs> And I just pray, I pray, God, make it real. Make it, we can't generate that kind of faith. You can't generate it. You can't say, oh, today I'm going to be faithful. You just ask him. You say, Lord, give me faith. Faith is a gift. Give me faith. Give me faith to believe in who you are and, and what your plan is for my life. And we pray that this morning in Jesus' name, Lord, give us all an extra dose of faith. Lord, so when we walk outside and we look into those clouds, we're looking for you. We're looking for your soon return. Because, why? Because he lives. He lives. Amen. And I can face tomorrow. Amen. Did I? That helps. <coughs> oh, I gotta turn this thing off. Flat. 
Good morning. Good morning. Well, we have a new usher today. Who shall it be? Who wants to be an usher? Owen? Ollie? Ephraim, come on down. You can come with a Molly. Grace isn't here, so she's our usher. <coughs> usher girl. So we're going to take up an offering, amen? Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord God, for this day. I praise you and thank you, Lord God, that you are pouring out a blessing upon us, Lord God, that we don't understand. And I just pray, Lord God, as we lift up our finances to you, that your hands would be upon us. That your promises would be on us. And Lord, you promise us that, Lord, that we would be able to not contain the blessings that, Lord God, that you would put upon us as we give to you cheerfully, Lord God. And we can't comprehend that or understand that, Lord Jesus, but we give, Lord God, with a joyful heart knowing that we can outgive you. And we just thank you and praise you for this day. And Lord, in this blessing, in Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. Go ahead, Effie. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. Amen. Well, this weekend we're celebrating Memorial Day weekend. You know... Memorial Day is a day of remembrance, correct? Remembrance. Today is the day of remembrance. Not today, tomorrow. We actually celebrate Memorial Day, so that's the day of remembrance. We remember the fall and we honor those who sacrificed all for our freedoms and our liberties in this country. And, it, you know, you can, it's not just them that we remember. It's all of our loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord that we remember also. The Bible tells us in John chapter 15, verses 12 through 13, it says, This is my command, love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. And that is exactly what Jesus did for all of us. And that is exactly what he did for all of you and for all of those who come to Christ Jesus. He gave his life for us. Amen. You know, last night, Julie and I were sitting there, we were watching the news for a little bit. I think it was... Brian Kilmeade, we, we never really watched Brian Kilmeade, you know, at all. But we were sitting there, we got home, it was late, and we were eating dinner and it was late, and we were eating in front of the TV, which is a bad habit that we're creating, that I've created. So, but as we're sitting there, we were listening to Brian Kilmeade, he was interviewing a gentleman on there who was a special ops um, soldier. Special ops means exactly that. He did special operations. He was highly trained. I believe he was a SEAL. He could have been a SEAL. He could have been a Ranger. You know, they have special, each unit, each military has their own special ops operators that control the battlefields. And they're usually high ranking men. You know, men that are, that are not afraid of battle, men that are battle-worn, they know what to expect, they know what to do, they, they're the ones that are giving everybody instructions in the battlefield on what, what's going on and what's taking place and where they need to be. They control the battle. And they find out what their enemy is doing. Well, this guy he was interviewing... They did this thing, it's called Triple Seven. Seven jumps, seven countries in seven days. And they said it was impossible. 
And they were doing this in remembrance of their soldiers, of their friends that fell in battle. And this one guy in particular that Brian Kilmeade was interviewing said he lost more than 50 of his friends in battle. More than 50. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. And you can see it in his interview when he was talking to him. You can see the emotions in this guy's eyes and the emotions in this guy's face as he was remembering those soldiers, his friends that he fought with, right next to, literally right next to that fell in battle. And he said one guy he was doing it for, in particular, was a really close friend of his, Navy SEAL. And he said... He said that he threw himself on an IED to save his buddies. And he himself gave his life. And he was doing that seven jumps in seven days in seven countries in memory of his sacrifice of his close friend that threw himself on an IED to save his life. To save the rest of the people's lives. And that just stirred me in my spirit as I'm writing my sermon this morning. I was thinking of that. And I'm just thinking how powerful that was. You know, that a man... You know, in the military, they kind of train you to react like that. you got to react fast. And you, you can't think about it because if you think long, you think wrong, and you usually end up dead. You know? And you hear stories of war stories of other soldiers doing things like this young man did who gave his life to save his friends. You know, I'm now totally off my sermon, but do you know what? God sent his son, and he did exactly that same thing. Jesus did exactly the same thing that that young man did. To save his friends, Jesus saved us. He gave his all. God gave Jesus his best. Right? God gave his best, his own son, as a sacrifice for all of us here today. It's like Jesus jumping on an IED for you and for me to save our souls, to save our lives, to redeem us from the pit. Jesus redeemed us. He saved us. And we can, we, we'll never forget for over 2,000 years now, that story has been preached. Think about that. In my sermon I have, you know, I remember days when we would, you know, as kids, I remember them going to, uh, like, the Pearl Harbor for Memorial Day services. They have a Remembrance Day just for Pearl Harbor, but that particular time sticks out in my mind. As the president went to Pearl Harbor... To remember the fallen soldiers on that infamous day, it was December 7th, 1941, that the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Do you know that the Japanese were actually in Washington, D.C., making plans, you know, to, to do trade and work with the United States? At the same time, they also were having plans to bomb Pearl Harbor, they were actually, it was actually like a decoy. And do you know that our President of the United States didn't even know that Pearl Harbor happened until almost 24 hours later? Because you've got to remember, the Times was 1941. They had wire service that they had to send messages to. It wasn't like you could pull out your cell phone and be recording all of this that's going on and send it across the world in a matter of seconds anymore. They didn't have that type of technology back then. It took our president, who was Dwight D. Eisenhower, almost 24 hours to get the news that Pearl Harbor has been bombed and that over 2,000 soldiers have been killed, almost 2,400 and some soldiers. Now there are some here that remember that day that were here. My mother-in-law remembers that day. Ed, do you remember that day? I mean, they were younger, but she remembers. They remember the days. Hearing it over the radio. 
I don't even think people had TVs in their houses then. Think about that. Mo all through the radio. But I remember them going there, commemorating the loss of life and remembering the day of Pearl Harbor. You don't hear much about it anymore. Back then, when, we were, when I was little, you, you, you heard more about it. It seems like. I can remember them. You know, the memorial service is right over the uh, USS Arizona. I literally can remember them walking over that, and you can look down through the memorial that they have set up for the USS Arizona for Pearl Harbor for Remembrance Day. There's a glass floor at the bottom, and you can actually see the ship underneath your feet. And I think it was Ronald Reagan and when he walked out there and he said, permission to come on board, you know, because when you stepped on somebody's ship, you asked for permission to come aboard the ship. And I remember his speech. I don't remember it verbatim at all, but I remember him standing up there giving just a wonderful speech about all the men and women that have lost their lives on that infamous day in 1941, December 7th, 1941. You know, Dwight D. Eisenhower was president then, and when he addressed the troops and the, and the people of what happened, this is what he said. He said, soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon a great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hope and prayers of liberty, loving people everywhere, march with you. March with you. 2,403 U.S. personnel lost their lives on that day. A lot of people in one day. I'll never forget, and most of here, most of us here will never forget the day when 9 11 struck. 9 11 is a, actually is a great day. 9 11 is my wife's birthday, which was a very hard year that year to celebrate. It was almost impossible to really celebrate her birthday that year, September 11th. But did you know that September 11th is also Jesus' birthday? That September 11th, many things, is like one of the days that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt it was a glorious day for God. And I want to tell you something. This is exactly how the enemy works in your lives. He wants to take something that was good, that God established, and he wants to turn it to something that is bad. That was a terrible day, that day in 9-11, when we saw the Twin Towers fall. And those who have seen it actually are alive and see it, can remember to this day exactly where they were when they saw it. You know, I can't remember where I was yesterday, but I can remember exactly where I was on 9-11 when that happened. I remember the job that I set the guys up, and I just so happened to stop at the little mobile gas station in Appalachian with the McDonald's in it to get me, a, I'm sure it was probably a sugar-free, a sugar-free a sugar-free power drink, and also, you know, not a honey bun. But I can remember the first plane already hit the tower, and I can remember when I walked in the doors as they slid open, I'm turning and I look at the TV, and I, and I see the tower on fire, and they said, oh, a plane hit the tower, the trade towers. And I sat there, and the first thing I thought was, 
oh, somebody's in big trouble. Somebody at the towers of the airport made a grave mistake or a pilot made a grave mistake and somebody's in big trouble because there's a lot of lives that just got lost. And as I'm watching this on the TV, all out of the blue, you just saw the corner eye coming, another plane hits the other tower. And then you think, oh, what is going on? And then you hear of other planes and one that's going toward the Pentagon and hits, actually hits the Pentagon. And then, they're, and then all flights cancel. You know, when that happened, and all of a sudden, no planes in the sky that day at all. Except for fighter planes. Looking for bad guys, because I knew that this was an attack, a terrorist attack upon our nation. And then that flight, Flight 93, where the passengers of that flight fought against the terrorist group. And the plane ended up crashing in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The total loss of life on that day was 2,993 people, or 96 people, including the plane that landed in Shanksville and the plane that hit the Pentagon. Over 2,700 and some people died just at the tower. And they erected the memorial service. A memorial. Who were alive and have seen that? We'll never forget that day. That day, that day those planes will be in your memory for always. For always. Memorial days are to remember those that have lost our lives, that lost their lives. Memorials also are things to remember And not just of those who have lost their lives, but on the things that God has done. You know, they say Memorial uh, Day actually was established back in the 1800s when a group of people went out and they started putting flags and things on the gravestones in some little town. That started the whole thing. That started the whole thing of Memorial Day. Well, there's been Memorial Days in past history that go all the way back into Genesis. When Jacob wrestled with God, when he saw the ladder come down, Jacob's ladder, and he wrestled with God, Jacob set up a memorial there to remember that that place where God came down from heaven and wrestled with him and dislocated his hip, that he would never forget that that place is a holy place where God came down. And he set up a memorial there. Another time I can remember reading in the scriptures, and this is in Joshua, you know, and I've always thought it would be powerful because you think of the times when Moses led the Egyptians out of Egypt, or the Israelites out of Egypt, you know, and he struck the rock, and the rock split in two. You know, they, they say they found that rock over there in the Middle East where water came pouring out of the rock because people were grumbling because they didn't have water to drink. He didn't like people to grumble, you know. He fed, God was feeding them manna for 40 years. They grumbled over the manna. So then he sent them quail every day. Then they probably grumbled over the quail. And then they didn't have water, and he grumbled over the water. And Moses got mad at the people, and he struck the rock. And you know, because of Moses getting mad and he actually struck the rock, that kept him from going into the promised land. That kept him from going into the promised land. But all these memorials that they set up, can you imagine being led out of Egypt, the Israelites, by a pillar of, uh, a cloud of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night? being let out and that, that was protecting your camp knowing that that was God and then God parting the Red Sea and you walking through it on dry ground well that's exactly what happened when the Israelites went into the promised land and that's when God told Joshua to be strong and courageous to be very strong and courageous as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. 
So what happened when they were getting ready to go after Moses has died and after they mourned Moses' death? God told Joshua to get the Ark of the Covenant. It's time to go into the promised land. Get the priest. Walk out into the Red Sea. Let the ark go before you. Let God's presence go before you. Right? There's something I can preach on right now. How many of us need God's presence to go on before them before we do anything to prepare the way for our lives and our children? But what do they do? They took the Ark of the Covenant and they marched out to the uh, Jordan River, which was at flood stage. Right? That's what it says in the Bible in Joshua. Joshua chapter 3. It says that they walked out to the Jordan River, the priest with the Ark of the Covenant first. And as soon as they stepped into the waters of the Jordan River, the river was held back at flood stage. Now, we all live near a river, and we've seen what flood stage can do to a river. Can you imagine in 2011... All of a sudden, we're at flood stage, at the highest record level of flooding that we've ever seen in Susquehanna at, stop and get heaped up into a pile. Picture that happening. And then the Israelites crossing the Jordan River over into the Promised Land on dry ground, just like, just like when God parted the Red Sea. And when all the Israelites got across to the sea and the priests were still there in the middle of the, uh, not sea, in the middle of the river, Joshua said to the tribes of Israelite, he said, you take 12 men. This is what God told them to do. You take 12 men. You go out in the middle of the river and you get a boulder and you carry it to the place where we stop and rest. And when we're at the place that we stop and rest, you set up a memorial there. They're called remembrance stones. You set up a memorial there to remember what God has done and where God has brought you. So, so the 12 tribes went out, each one man per tribe went out and grabbed 12 boulders. And they picked it out of the uh, riverbed and they carried it to the place where they rested. And then Joshua himself went out into the middle of the Jordan River where the Ark of the Covenant was. And he set up 12 stones in the middle of the river to where the Ark of the Covenant stood that heaped up the waters. Where God's presence was that heaped up the waters. As a remembrance, now your Bible will tell you that those stones are still there to this day. Till today. Can you imagine that? Over thousands of years later, in the middle of the river, that those stones are still there? I mean, I just think about that, how powerful that is. You know, and a river could be powerful. It could move some pretty big stones. But you know what? God's presence is more powerful than any river. God's presence is more powerful than any wind, any rain, Anything that this earth has ever seen. And it's only because of God that those things are possible. But those stones are still there to this day. I'd love to go back. I've always wanted to go and just like, I want to go find those 12 stones. You know? I think it would be exciting to see them. But there's 12 stones that they set outside the river where they rested. As a place of remembrance of what God has done. And where God brought them. And do you know, I'm preaching on it, and that's over thousands of years later. Not just me, but there's probably millions of people that have preached on those 12 stones. As stones to remember of what God has done. You know, sometimes we got to set up our own memorials in our own lives. To remind us of what God has done for each one of us. To remind us and to remind ourselves where God has brought me. 
from where I was in my captivity to where I am now in the liberty that Jesus has given to me. Sometimes we got to remember. Because when we remember what God has done for us, then we give God the glory. Amen. We praise God. We give Him the glory. God has done so much for me in my life. And it's not because of what I've done, but it's because of what He's done in my life. It's because of His love for me. And it's because of His love for each one of you. God, if you stay faithful to God, God promises that He'll be faithful to you all the days of your life. God says that He will not uproot a righteous man. Right? I don't know what that is. It does it on its own accord. So, I'm not worrying about it. But you know, probably the greatest memorial that I can think of in my whole life comes down to one thing. If you really think about it, what is the greatest memorial that you can think of? The greatest memorial that you can think of is the cross. You know, I, I look at the cross. I look at that wooden cross right there. And I think that wooden cross has been around the whole world. You know? Who is the guy who actually traveled with a wooden cross? around? The, oh, there was a man who actually walked the whole earth through every nation with a wooden cross. And it took him his whole life to do it. And I can't remember his name. Does anybody know his name? But, yeah, isn't that funny? You know it. You know it's right there on the tip of your tongue, in your mind. But that cross not only was carried across the whole world, but that cross is probably in every nation, every state. I know it's in every state of the United States. It's probably in every nation of the world. Even in a communist nation, that cross stands. The greatest monument that I can know of that's been around the whole world that not just our nation knows of, but every nation knows of, is the cross. And you got to get to the cross to get to Jesus. Amen? Amen. And Jesus, if you meet Jesus, that's the first place he's going to take you is to the cross. Because you got to go through the cross. Going through the cross is being redeemed, is being covered, is being protected. The cross of Christ. You know, we saw something on uh, saw something today that Julie showed me that you know when the Israelites marked out the blood on the doorpost and it's lentil. I was wrong this morning, but it was lentil or mantle is what they used to call it. Because when you used to make a door frame, they had two posts that went up and they had like a mantle over the top like you would have on a fireplace mantle, right? That held up the door. That was the door. And they marked both the door posts and then they marked the mantle on the top when they dipped the blood with the hyssops and, you know, dipped the hyssop into the blood and marked them. Well, that blood also dropped down on the door. And that blood kept the death angel from entering into that house, passing over them. That's exactly what the blood of Christ does for us. It keeps the enemy away from us. When we apply the blood of Christ to our lives. You know, and it marked out every spot where Jesus was pierced by his hands, the doorpost, crown of thorns on his head and his feet because the blood dripped from the lentil down to the floor when they marked it over the mantle or the lentil. The places where Jesus was pierced. 
powerful. The blood is powerful. There's power in the blood. And you need that blood sacrifice of Jesus to redeem your lives. The greatest memorial that I know is the cross. Another great memorial that I know is that we do it on Sundays quite a bit here. And in remembrance of him. What is that? Communion. The breaking of bread. And partaking of wine. He does this. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. For thousands of years, people have been doing this in remembrance of Jesus. And we all remember what Jesus did. We all remember the sacrifice that Jesus did. Thousands of, thousands of years later, you think about that. Thousands of years later. You know, thousands of years from now, we might remember Pearl Harbor. We might remember 9-11, but it'll probably be written in just a history book that thousands of years from now people will read. And they probably won't celebrate it like we celebrate it now because it would happen in our lifetimes or that we know of, remember. Unlike we celebrate the cross. But I guarantee you, thousands of years from now, if we're not in the millennial reign with Jesus, which I think we're going to be entering in soon, when he comes again, as my wife said on those clouds coming out over the sky, they'll still be preaching the cross. Thousands of years from now, that cross will endure. What Jesus said will endure. What this word said will live on forever will endure. But I guarantee you, Pearl Harbor won't endure. I guarantee you, 9-11 will not endure like that work of Jesus did on that cross. Amen? So, let's bow and pray as I close. Father, I just thank you, Lord, and praise you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. I thank you for all the men and women that have sacrificed their lives for us for our freedoms. I thank you for all the patriarchs that have gone before us. I thank you for all the men and women that lost their lives sharing the gospel of Christ across this world. I thank you, Lord God, for all the men and women, Lord God, that sacrificed their lives for our freedoms here in this place. Lord God, for righteousness sake, Lord Jesus, I thank you and I praise you Lord, and we give you all the honor and glory, Lord God, for this, for this day. I thank you for each person here. I pray your blessings upon them. Pray that you would speak to them, Lord God, and that you would use them mightily for your kingdom. I pray that we would apply the blood to our lives, to our families, to our children and our grandchildren. That, Lord, that it would keep your blood is so powerful that, Lord God, not even the death angel can penetrate it, that you would keep death and decay far from us, that, Lord God, that you would keep the enemy far from us, Lord God, and his minions. And I pray this, Lord God, and I pray for your blessings and your covering. In Jesus' name, amen.